So the title uh, GitOps, uh, we're going to talk about Git a little bit. I, I, I found this screen, um, which has a photo of me looking a bit younger. Uh, but I, if you, an apologies to the GitLab people, um, but I, I do most of my stuff on GitHub. Um, so I use Git a lot. I'm, uh, uh, I'm an engineer. I, I build, maintain software. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a business person. Um, so that's, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, so what about you? So who, who knows Kubernetes? I'll put my own hand up. Yeah, OK, most people. Good, good, good. Um, who runs Kubernetes in production? A little bit less. OK. Uh, who's using continuous deployment? Just a few people. Continuous integration? More people. OK. And who, who already knows all about GitOps? Nobody. One? OK. Maybe. Maybe a couple. I, I should put my own hand up, right? I, uh, I'm here to talk. OK, so that's interesting. Um, uh, so the, the word is out there. Um, the word was, was coined by my boss, Alexis, uh, who is uh, this guy, yeah, um, the CEO of Weaveworks. And, uh, and he, he coined it to describe something that we were already doing. Um, but anyway, here's Kelsey Hightower, who's, who's way more cool than I am. He says, stop scripting and start shipping. So we're, that's what we're going to be talking about in this session. Um, so this is, I didn't, I didn't want to go on a, like a mystery tour. Uh, I want to give you all the information on the first slide. Um, so uh, so this, is, this is GitOps. I'm, I'm going to walk through this a bit more slowly now. We'll, we'll come back to this slide. Um, but there it is. That, that's, that's what I'm talking about. Um, but if we go back, uh, why might we be interested in this? And I, I, I kind of I took a look at the title of this whole session, and, and I thought, you know, cloud native transformation. What is, what is this transformation that we're um, thinking about or looking for? And, uh, and I thought, you know, the, the big thing, how, how long to get a new server? Um, so in the, in the traditional data center, that, that might be a month. Um, and in the cloud, two minutes. So that's probably, does that, does that kind of resonate? That's the transformation that, that a lot of people are looking for um, in going to the cloud. How, how long does it take to deliver a software change? Um, so, well, according to Forrester, uh, so this is, this is how, how many businesses release monthly or faster, and it's like 20%. What about, I mean, who, who here releases monthly or faster? Yeah. Yeah, that might be 20%. Okay. So, so we're, in, we're in kind of standard company. Um, so how can, we, how can we speed that up? How can we um, uh, release fast? So the, the company I work for, we, we release uh, most days, um, during the week at least. Uh, try not to try not to work at the weekend, but um, uh, sometimes several times a day, um, and and that is powered by GitOps. So um, uh, and then I, I I I looked. I wanted to look at like why. There's lots of different reasons why people release more slowly, but I I found this uh, I found this artifact. This is um, this is apparently someone's release. And this isn't even the release process. This is the release approval process. <laughs> so this, might be, um, this might be part of the reason why it takes a month or more. Um, we got lots of stuff to do. 
lots of uh, checks to put in the box, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, one more, one more backstory. Um, so one day, we we run WeaveWorks runs a um, uh, online service, Weave Cloud, and, and where you can uh, there are tools for continuous deployment and monitoring and visualization and and stuff like that. Um, one day, uh, a few years ago. Um, a typing slip caused all of our servers to be deleted. Um, and, uh, and we were up and running again in 45 minutes. And, and this is actually, the reason I mention this is this, this is what got the CEO interested in uh, in talking about this, he's, he he was amazed. Like, how how could you do this? How what? And that 45 minutes includes all the time spent going, oh shit. <laughs> um, and um, so uh, yeah, so so you know, he he was he was totally um, amazed by this and and really interested in. Uh, what, how did we do that? What is the circumstances? Um, what are the practices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so here it is. We, we use declarative infrastructure. Everything, everything is described in files. Um, all of those files are in Git. Uh, they're under version control. And, and, um, and Git is the single source of truth. Git, Git, Git is the, the master. Git, drives forwards into what we're actually running. Uh, Git, Git is the single source of truth. Um, so when the unfortunate event happened and all of our servers were gone, um, we could reapply the config that we had in Git. New servers came up, um, installed the software, uh, and then we're running Kubernetes, so, so reapply the manifests, and all the pods come up. Um, and we're up and running again 45 minutes later. Um, so that's, you know, that, again, that's, that's GitOps in a nutshell. The, um, the ops part, uh, we ch every change to the environment is a Git commit. Um, so that means you can see all the history. It means you can see who, who changed what when. It means you can roll back to any point in time. Um, but it also means that the config you have got in a file is the config you're running, and not the thing that someone fiddled with last Tuesday to make it to tweak it so that it just you know just wasn't working right. And I logged into the I SSH'd into the box and I tweaked it and uh, oh we can't we lost. We lost a record of that. So if, if you can, in our environment, you can SSH into a box and change something, uh, and a few minutes later, an alert will pop up because it no longer matches what's in Git. Um, in fact, if you do that at the Kubernetes level, it'll just get overwritten. Uh, we, we, we don't overwrite automatically at the, at the lower levels. But at the Kubernetes level, if you, if you like kubectl change something, um, Less than a minute later, it'll get reverted. It'll get overwritten to what's in Git. Um, OK. Hopefully, I put, all, I put this slide up again. So it says the same thing. It says, um, it says describe your system de declaratively, uh, version control. I'm saying Git, like I use Git, but it doesn't have to be Git. The, the, this is a concept. Uh, so if you want to use Mercurial or Clear case or whatever. Perform, yeah. I wonder if I get a laugh at clear case. I guess it's gone on so it, we're so far beyond there that I don't even get a laugh. Uh, so um, changes to the desired state or commits uh, and software agents sync up. Um, 
And uh, okay, so let's go through uh, some more of the. Um, uh, okay, one more slide. Um, yeah, so anyone can use GitHub or GitLab, whatever. Um, we people people this happens. People can join our team and they can start making changes. Um, a, a config changes are PR'd. Uh, they can be approved, whatever, all that process can be, can be done. And, um, and yeah, it's not, it's not anything very new or clever. I mean, I, 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 it's not like we invented some genius uh, new technique that everyone has to adopt. Um, it, it's all pretty simple stuff that, that you may be doing all of this, or you may be doing some of it, or, uh, but you know, it's not, it's not like, um, it's not hard to imagine how you could be using it, I hope. Um, OK, so let's walk through, uh, because I guess, I guess most people put their hands up, they knew Kubernetes. Um, so, so this bit's fairly easy. Um, I wasn't sure what the audience was going to oh. OK. Uh, I wasn't sure what the audience was going to be. Um, so I, I, I included this stuff. So the, the, the high-level view, you know, Kubernetes runs a set of nodes. There's, um, let's do the laser tech. Uh, this thing, uh, the control plane, um, uh, has um, a set of objects that define what's supposed to be running. Um, and and, and that's, uh, that's the declarative state of the system. The other, the other parts of Kubernetes, um, this part running on each node, kubelet, uh, reads the spec of what's supposed to be running and then runs the, the actual software in pods. Um, but it, most people put their hands up, they knew Kubernetes, so we don't, we're not going to dwell on that. Um, Oh yeah, there we go. So the, the, I drew some arrows. Uh, I, I put up a warning because I thought there might be like business people in the room. Um, I, I promise this is the only time I'm going to show some YAML. Uh, but I, I, wanted, I wanted to stress um, how easy it is uh, at this level. Um, so this. Uh, this is a complete uh, declarative description of a, of a service, of a, of a deployment uh, running in a Kubernetes system. Um, uh, it, is, it is in YAML, but it, you know, it's not that scary. Um, and so the, the, the point, the, this, is, this is what you would, you would bring out as a file and put under version control. And then the things you might want to change in the file, you might want to change the number of, of replicas. You might want to scale up uh, you know, to 100 nodes, uh, 100 pods, um, or you might want to scale it down you know, if it's a quiet day. Uh, and other thing you might want to change, you might want to change the version of the software. Now, in a, in a more realistic uh, manifest, would, would probably run to about three, four, five times the length of that with a lot more detail. But the, the principle is the same. All, all we're doing is editing this file, making changes to this file, putting that in a, in a git commit, and then syncing that up to the system. So uh, it really is kind of painfully simple at that level. Um, the slight pauses, because I, I press on this thing and it doesn't happen, and I'm not sure what's going on, but we'll, we'll get there. Right. Uh, so another, another kind of anecdote, this is from my personal history. Um, uh, I worked in, a, in an environment where we had all the config in a database. Um, and it, it was, this is actually a photo of the, uh, the trading floor where I worked. Uh, and these are, are some of the people that I worked with. Um, and they, they really did have six screens. Uh, this is uh, 2006, I think the photo was taken, 13 years ago. Um, we, uh, we, had a, we had a pretty sweet system. It had automated deployment. You could, you could do this same thing. You could um, change the version number, and it would roll out. Uh, 
and we'd put it in a database because that seemed like an obvious thing to do. But uh, we didn't have the history. Um, and, and so it was, a, you know, really at times it was a bitch, like, well, why? Why is, the, why is it running that version? You know, who changed that? Um, we didn't have the history. So the, for me, just reflecting on, on my own history with this kind of technology and, and, um, and this kind of way of working, uh, having the audit trail, um, who changed what when, uh, having the tools to see that very, very easily, um, is is a, a, a massive benefit of GitOps. Um, so, uh, oh, I even have an example of the history. Um, and again, uh, apologies to the GitLab's people. Um, so this is this is an actual. Uh, um, YAML file, one of our deployments, and we, we run Prometheus. Uh, and it is in our um, dev environment, because I'm not allowed to show production and details in public. Um, but you know, this is, this is the actual history of this file. We, we do this stuff every day. Uh, and they, these are kind of config changes. Um, just, uh, oh, there's a, there's a version change. Um, so I, you know, this is, again, this is the kind of thing you get, the, the history, who changed what when. OK, let's look a little deeper. How am I doing for time? Uh, OK. Um, so start, start with a simple case, um, which I've been belaboring. Uh, you, have, you put all the files. Um, in Git, you, you, the, the manifest file, the YAML files, which, which Kubernetes understands, uh, you put them in Git. And then you need something to synchronize them up. Um, and we have made an open source tool that does this called Wave Flux, uh, which we host on GitHub. Who's, who's, who's run Flux? Anyone? To one person. OK. Did it work? I, sh I shouldn't ask that question. Uh, <laughs> it'd be a kind of a different talk if uh, <laughs> if you said no. <laughs> um, good. I'm glad. I'm glad it worked for you. Yeah. So um, I mean, you might. You, um, a lot of people look at this problem and they think, well, why? You know, why do I need a tool? This is just kubectl apply. Um, you know, why? Why? Why even talk about it? And um, my answer to that is basically, uh, I don't care. Um, because like, well, if you, if you download the source, you'll see there's like 30,000 lines. Basically, there's a lot of corner cases. There's a lot of, of kind of little wrinkles and things that people want to do. Um, the, uh, there's, there's a certain amount of automation across different features and, and things like that. But um, uh, I, I do believe you can do this in a, in a bash script in, in like eight lines or something like that, just without all the corner cases covered. So, um, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's open source. Um, Flux is one tool. Uh, you can probably find other ones, and you can probably make your own. Um, so, so we put the files in Git, uh, and we synchronize to Kubernetes. That's, that's the basic operation for config, just as I've been describing. Um, OK. Maybe if I stand closer. Oh, OK. So here's a person. A uh, person has made a config change, and we sync, we sync it up to Kubernetes. Um, the, another part of the picture is the, is the image repo. If, you, if you're running software, that's going to come down um, from, you know, Docker Hub or, or somewhere like that. And uh, uh, that's a, a separate repo, but configured by what's in, in the uh, git config. Let's move on um, to look at uh, uh, continuous deployment. So if, well, if you have a build pipeline, so this is um, 
this is Git for software. Uh, that's going to build, and, and that's the output of the software going into the image repo. So this is, this is the case where you're building your own software. Uh, you know, you're, making, you're making changes to the source code, or someone is making changes to the source code. Um, the output of that uh, goes into an image repo like Docker Hub. Um, and then what you might like, you might like continuous deployment, meaning every time you get a new change to the source code, uh, it makes it all the way through to your running system. So I'm going to stick to pressing the space bar. Um, so, so what's useful there? Well, the laser part still works. That's interesting. Uh, so um, yeah, so what you can have is, is you can automate that piece too. And, and Flux will do this as well. So every time a new image appears here, we'll actually update the version uh, that's in Git. Uh, which then synchronizes through to the uh, Kubernetes um, uh, system running your environment. So, um, so the top line is continuous integration. Uh, the bottom line is continuous deployment. Um, the, the, uh, we, we separate the two. I think I have some more slides about this, but it, it's kind of a... Uh, it's kind of an interesting point that we, we separate the two... Um, tasks. Uh, so we, we automate, for, personally, we automate um, every version that gets built goes into our staging environment uh, by default, automatically. Um, and we, we do not do that into production. Um, we are scared. Uh, so I don't, I don't know. Uh, you know, people should live their own lives, but uh, we, are, we are not brave enough to automatically feed every change in the source code through to production. Um, so what we do is we, uh, we put a human approval step um, in between uh, staging and production. But it, it's the same Git repository, it's the same config, um, you know, with, with kind of differences in scaling and, and things like that. But it's, it's the same config uh, that runs our staging environment and production environment. Um, and, and this is a PR process. Uh, well, it, it can be a PR process or, or it can be um, just a, a, a promotion release. We have a, we have a tool to do that as well to um, kind of copy the versions through without, without actually having to edit the file yourself. But this, I guess my point is, this can be any process you like. Um, all the tools are there. The, the, it's just a git commit at the end of the day. Um, however you get there, it's just a git commit. So, uh, so this is effectively how we run our system, and, and you can run your system. Um, the, the tooling is open source. Uh, the concepts are really pretty simple. Um, we, we automate this step here, which is to staging, and we, we have a human decide if it's ready to go to production. What else? Um, oh, yeah. So th this is something I often hear. Uh, people say, well, I just, I just drive my de deployment. I don't need this extra tool. I don't, you know, why, um, why are we separating CD from CI? Uh, and, and basically, if, if I step back there, because um, you know, I, have, I have one CI pipeline and multiple CD pipelines. Uh, so to me, it, do, it doesn't work so well to have one thing driving, um, because I actually have a, a multi multiplicity. The other, the other thing is there's, there's multiple ones of these, right? I mean, in, in our system, we, we deploy many different projects. We deploy things that were built at Weaveworks. We deploy uh, memcached. We, we deploy other stuff that, that is built in, uh, in other people's projects. So there is not a one-to-one -one mapping of continuous integration and continuous deployment. Uh, so we separate the two things. Um, we, we, we run uh, continuous integration. The, the final product of continuous integration is an image, which has passed all of its tests. Um, and then we run continuous deployment, and the end of that is a running environment. 
So that's uh, yeah, that's a comment I often hear. You know, I just oh, I just put the I just put the deployment in my Jenkins file. Um, another a, a little bit more detailed wrinkle is um, occasionally uh, this process of applying the updates will fail part way through. Um, so this happens, you know, particularly you make, you make change the way things are laid out or something like that, and it, it fails because of a, a permissions, uh, a missing permission to make that change, or, or it fails because the version of Kubernetes has changed and it doesn't accept that, that data anymore, or, you know, something, or maybe, maybe it's the network glitch. Um, it's, it's good to blame everything on the network, right? It's, you can always blame everything on the network. Um, if, if something goes wrong in this final apply stage, um, and you, you're changing like, uh, like four YAML files, and two of them got changed and two of them didn't, um, then, then trust me, that is a hell of a job to unpick and figure out what happened, and so on and so on and so on. In the GitOps world, what will happen is it'll do it again. It, it'll do it again like a minute later. Um, and it's, it's just applying the same files, well, unless, unless another update has come through in the meantime. It's just applying the same files. So um, it, when the underlying problem, the network glitch or whatever, when that gets fixed, uh, it will just apply the config. And you don't, you don't have to debug it. You don't have to figure out the half, um, half applied config. So, um, uh, so we do not recommend that you drive deployment from CI um, because uh, it's just much more dependable and reliable to separate the two things and run CD separately from CI. Uh, okay, let's move on to um, uh, observing stuff um, because Another thing that, that lets you move faster is if you know what's going on. The, uh, it's all very well to, to kind of produce software and, and throw it out there, um, but you know things go wrong. People make mistakes in the software. Things, uh, things don't go the way you expect. Um, so uh, what makes things a lot better for, from the point of view of someone operating the system is uh, observability. So if you have some idea uh, how the thing is actually running, especially in production, um, then you are going to feel better about uh, pushing things out faster. You can, you can release faster if you know more about what's going on. And also, if you have the confidence that you can always roll back. You know, the Git history lets you roll back to any point in time completely accurately across your entire system. So. Um, so it basically turns into a loop uh, like this. Yeah, this is a better one to take a photo of. Yeah. Um, the, uh, uh, the loop around uh, release, uh, observe, operate, um, that, that you, you, know, you make a new release, uh, you push it out, you see how it's working, um, you know, you're ready for the next one, you push that out, you see how it's working. Uh, and, and you get into this loop, um, and you basically drive that as fast as your organization is comfortable with. Um, uh, so for us, that's, uh, that's pretty much every day. Uh, not, not necessarily the same software every day, but, but we have a lot of different parts of the system. So, um, so things are released uh, pretty often. So, um, so that's... Uh, conceptually uh, talking about, about this kind of loop. Um, we can get into a little bit more a kind of um, uh, particular way of doing that, uh, which we call progressive delivery or, or uh, canary releases is, is sort of what uh, uh, another, another term that people know. Um, so the, the idea here is uh, we start off um, and when we're running version one uh, of, our, of our service, um, we're running multiple uh, instances, maybe, and, and the traffic is being kind of routed to, to all of those instances. 
Um, and then we, uh, uh, we introduce version two, um, and we get, uh, we direct um, a small amount, let's say 5% of the traffic to version two. So this is, this is a, what's called a canary deployment, because you, uh, you kind of, you, you don't care whether the canary dies or not. The, it's, just, it's just a small percentage of the traffic, and, and um, uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna run a small percentage of the traffic, and then you're gonna observe that and, and see if it works. If that works, you're gonna ramp up the amount going to the new version. Um, you're gonna run more of those uh, replicas, ramp that up. Um, now, all of this, uh, the, the, the tooling and so on, um, we have a, another open source project called Flagger, uh, which automates this. Um, you know, other, other ways to do it are possible. Um, Flagger works with, with Istio. You need something to um, redirect the traffic to be able to send a, a percentage of the traffic to a particular version of the software. Um, so it works with Istio, it works with App Mesh. Um, and if anyone wants to make it work with another Mesh, then send us a PR. It's, it's open source. Or send us money. Um, so, uh, so if you if you got to if you got to 50% and it's all good, um, then we start uh, replacing the uh, version one with version two, um, and we basically go all the way up to 100% on version two, zero percent on version one, and then and then we kind of uh, oops we go back to the um, we go back to the beginning state, uh, the the right number of instances, um, but we're we're all on version two now. Uh, and this is automated looking at metrics. So you, you can define um, what you care about. It might be an error rate. So you, you'll ramp it up as long as, as long as everyone's getting the 200 responses and not the, not the 500s. Um, you can ramp it up based on latency, staying below uh, a threshold, whatever you like. The, the, um, this is automated canary deployments through metrics. Um, so automated driving around that... Um, that loop of uh, release, observe, automate, uh, operate. Excuse me. Um, this is uh, this is kind of cutting edge stuff, right? Fully automating this, um, but uh, 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 it exists um, and uh, uh, relies on on the amazing underlying features of Kubernetes and Istio or App Mesh. Um, so uh, that's, that's kind of, um, I don't know, next generation technology maybe for, uh, for some people. Um, but it, it, is, it is certainly possible. Uh, there, yeah, some considerations, like not, not every kind of software will do that. Um, so I just wanted to uh, just throw out, uh, put up some thoughts about, about evolution of these things. You know, if you, if your software is serving an API, you can't just drop an API, you know, change an API, drop one version, put in a new version, and do all of this uh, automated rollout, canary deployments, and so on. It, it is necessary that the new version you're putting out supports the same API as the old version. It's necessary that, uh, that everything broadly works the same. Um, uh, so what you what you might need to do if you if you are changing an API, you might need to support both of them for a period of time. So that's work, right? If you're a, if you're a developer, um, but uh, but it is necessary in order to work this way, in order to be able to just smoothly roll out new versions of the software. Um, uh, you need to do this extra work. You need to um, uh, not just abruptly change um, APIs and things like that. Uh, are the things that don't fit? Um, so yeah, basically don't do this to your Oracle database. Or whatever, uh, you know, whatever your primary storage, your, your things, um, things that, that kind of uh, hold on to data and uh, take uh, minutes to react to changes in configuration and so on. Don't 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 do this whole uh, 
multi multi times a day config changes um, to that. Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, generally, generally, I, I I advise people not if you if you're moving to Kubernetes, don't don't do the the primary storage. You know, if you have a big Oracle database, leave it where it is. At least for the first year, just run all the other stuff. Run run the run your web servers. Run your business logic. Run that stateless. Um, those things can can uh, cope with this kind of uh, rapid evolution and rapid changes, roll forward, roll back. Um, the uh, uh, your your primary store, um, unless it is exceptionally engineered to cope with that with that kind of way of working, um, and even even things like Cassandra, which which are engineered to run on many nodes, some of which may die. Uh, I still don't think you want to go like randomly rolling them forwards and backwards and so on. Did, does anyone run Cassandra? No, one. Yeah. Would you do that? Would you roll them forward? Like, no. Okay. Yeah. So, so we're talking. Uh, we're talking about your your like business logic, display logic, web servers, um, that kind of stuff. Um, we're we're not talking about your big Oracle database. Um, with the with this model, and I think oh yeah oh one more thing, uh, GitOps Kubernetes itself. Uh, so so far I was talking about the software that you run inside Kubernetes, um, but but what if you want to apply the same principle to Kubernetes itself? What if uh, for instance you you start with with no Kubernetes, you just have some nodes. You just have some VMs or bare metal machines running. Um, um, well, then we can we can do the same thing. We can put the config in Git. There is a uh, recently adopted um, specification, like like a YAML spec um, for Kubernetes clusters. It's, it's called the Cluster API. Uh, it's not really an API because you don't like make calls to it. It's, it's, a, it's a declarative definition of a cluster. Um, but you, could, you can take that as YAML files. You can stick it in Git. Um, there you go. Uh, you can uh, have some kind of agent which will understand that file and will install Kubernetes based on that format. Um, and, uh, and now you have a running Kubernetes cluster. Um, and then, uh, so installing it from scratch, you, you might do occasionally. Um, other stuff you might want to do, like a, a version upgrade to Kubernetes, uh, go from 14.0 to 14.1. That, that is a git commit, which is then synced up to your cluster um, in this world. And, uh, and it turns out we make one of those as well. Um, but again, you know, cluster, cluster, cluster API is a standard part of the Kubernetes project. Uh, so other people will have that too. Um, okay, I think I'm just about done. Uh, cunning subliminal advert. Um, we have uh, products to sell. Um, but this is my, uh, this is my message. Um, GitOps is, is really, really simple. Uh, Describe your whole system declaratively. Um, put that in a, in, a, in a version control system such as Git. Changes to the desired state are commits. Um, and sync it up automatically. Uh, and you're doing GitOps. So there we are. Thank you. Oh, and we're, yeah. Uh, we're running a, an AWS event tonight. If, um, if anyone wants a free drink, uh, then uh, uh, search for our uh, AWS Birds of a Feather session or try and type in that tiny uh, URL. Um, uh, we'd love to see you there. Does anyone have any questions? We've got one right there. So basically with Flux, if I just change a config map or a secret, will it restart my pod so they take that into consideration? Or do the containers have to have like a file watcher and notice it themselves? 
Yeah, that's, that's a good question. That's, uh, it's probably a little bit detailed, so maybe explain some of the background. Uh, uh, so uh, in Kubernetes, you, you can have a config map, like some, some sort of uh, data which is read by the running software. Um, and uh, if you make a change to that data, um, the, the default case is not, nothing happens. The, the software will uh, be able to read it, but it doesn't know that it should read it. Um, so in the, in the case of the uh, tool flux uh, that I was talking about, uh, does not itself help with that problem. Um, uh, one thing a lot of people do is they, um, uh, they take a hash of the contents and actually use that in the name of the, of the data. So when you change the contents, the name changes, so the spec changes, so you get a, you get a rolling deployment. Uh, Helm will do that automatically, and, and Flux will work with Helm. So you can, you can drive all this uh, with, with the straightforward YAMLs, or you can drive all this from Helm uh, and take advantage of that feature. Um, but it, it has, it's certainly a, a requested feature in the Flux tool itself. Um, uh, let me think. Yeah, the, the, I mean, there's, there's, it's actually a question about uh, f the file watcher thing. What, you will get the effect that everything will, will see the new file at the same time. And if you made a mistake in it, uh, everything is going to read bad config at the same time, um, which is not great. Uh, so if, if you think of the idea of the canary rollout, you, you actually want that behavior. You, you want like 5% of your estates to read the config before the 95%. And we're, we, have, we don't have that feature yet, but that would be kind of where we'd like to think about things. Uh, but yeah, good, good question. Who has another question? Yeah. Any preference for handling secrets in the GitOps model? Uh, secret, yeah, you, you did mention secrets, and, and so two questions about secrets, really. Um, uh, so one of the things you might not, not want to do is just check in your secret uh, into your uh, Git repo. Um, uh, so one of the ways around that is to encrypt the secret with another key. Uh, that's the so-called sealed secret model, um, and that's, that's one that we've used. Uh, so that. In that, in that uh, event where you need to bring up your whole cluster in 45 minutes, you, you need to be able to find that other key, uh, which is not in the Git repo, and you need to be able to kind of get that out and, and put it in and so on. So um, some kind of other secrets manager like Vault or something like that is, is then going to outsource that problem. Um, so as long as you don't delete that, uh, you, you, um, you, can, you can leave the problem there. Um, uh, other ways, you know, I've talked a lot about how do we run in production, which I, th I think people are often interested in. Um, we run on AWS, and, and, and we kind of outsource a lot of that to the, um, the Amazon uh, authentication and identification system. So, uh, so there basically are, are no secrets in our software, and, and they uh, dynamically pick up credentials by talking to the, um, the IIM API in Amazon. Uh, so that, I, mean, I guess that's kind of the same thing as the vault idea, I guess. Like, like basically, don't have any secrets in your config. Pick them up dynamically from a, from a credential service. Um, uh, yeah, the, the secrets, uh, yeah, sealed secrets is kind of like, like the, the purest thing where they get, they get decrypted on the way into the system. Um, but I, I, I think we're, yeah, maybe still a little bit on, on the journey there. Um, I think if you, if you have to deal with that kind of thing, then, then there's, there's probably more evolution to come there. OK, hi. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, what is your forecast? Uh, will, so in the, past, uh, in the last part, it's uh, primary storage, I mean all legacy parts, right? Enterprise, hardware, software, everything what, what exists bef before Kubernetes and Cloud Native. Mm. Will GitOps cover this? Will this part just disappear and GitOps will be, Cloud Native will, will be everywhere? Or you see any third way? 
Uh, yeah, so I, I couldn't hear you very well, but I think, I think you're saying um, uh, what, what's, what's the future? Will, will GitOps cover more of the kind of legacy domain? Uh, uh, yeah. Yep. Um, well, probably. I mean, I, I, you know, legacy or not, the, the big distinction is about, it's really kind of the pets versus cattle thing. Is, is this something you have to kind of look after carefully? And, and you know you have to stroke it exactly the right way, and uh, or is it something you can just you know shoot it in the head and make another one, um, which is the cattle uh, domain, uh, because the the automated um, the automation is is more angled at, at the cattle um, way of doing things. So, I mean the the only the only way I could see more of the automation applying to stuff that needs very careful handling is if uh, maybe some kind of operator in the in the environment understands how to how to stroke the thing very carefully, like how to shut it down very carefully and then move it across to this other thing and then start it up very carefully. If you have that, then then yeah, you can you can do all this automation. You can do GitOps. Um, as long as your automation uh, does everything that your pet needs, um, so I, yeah, I don't, I don't know who's going to get there faster. I, you know, I, whether whether stuff will just migrate from being pet-like to being cattle-like, um, or whether more operators will be written. But some some of those things, um, you know, I, I go on about the big Oracle server. People use those things because they work really well, right? I, 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 don't, I don't necessarily believe that that's going to get swept away. Uh, you know, big, big iron databases work really well at the stuff that they're good at, uh, and you need to treat them carefully. You, you know, you don't want to just shoot it in the head um, it, to move it onto another node. So, um, uh, so probably for those things, they will get that automation um, built in, and, and, then, and then we can use these kind of techniques for everything. Thank okay. you, Ryan. Thank you.